That's a good one, Coach. Man, we need Jesus. He's our righteousness. He's our defense. Thank you, God, that our greatest need is you, and you have provided you for us. You're so good to us. Every hour we need you. Every hour we are dependent upon your grace, not just for the grace of life and the things that come in life, but we are dependent upon your salvation grace that you give to us and you provide for us because your love is steadfast. And you constantly do that. God, we are dependent every hour upon the mercy and grace shown through Christ for our salvation. And we're thankful that because of your promise and your word and your truth and your character and who you are, we stand, we sit, we live constantly in the undeserved mercy and grace of forgiveness through Christ that you give us. God, thank you so much. We need it so much. Thank you for providing it. And in that, God, thank you for just how we need, for all of our daily needs. And God, you're so good to us. So God, meet our needs right now, our spiritual needs through your word. Teach us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, um, we dealt with verse 2. We had planned to go through verse 4, but uh, we ended up not doing that. Spent all of our time in verse 2 where Paul is reminding us to stay, keep praying, just keep praying, constant prayer, continual prayer, committed to prayer, just constantly praying. This is, just, is not just a, an occasional thing in our lives. This isn't just that occasional workout that you do during the week <laughs> that you're not devoted really to. This is a continual practice in life, being watchful in it, staying awake as we pray. Constantly on alert of what to be praying for. Being thankful in our prayers. Being thankful not just for physical things, but the spiritual graces that God gives us and continues to do so. So as Paul, and remember he's in prison. He's in Rome, in prison. He writes Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Philemon. He writes these letters from being incarcerated in Rome. And here at the end of his letter to the Colossians, he says, okay, Pray, be watchful, be be thankful, and at the same time, as you do, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. I want you to see today, just very simply, this is a simple message, but it's also good for us. I want you to see a crucial content of our prayers. I want you to notice something. Paul, here in Colossians, to the Colossians, he is not requesting prayer for his release from prison. How many of our letters from prison asking for prayer would start with that? No. He's not requesting prayer for his release from prison. He's not requesting prayer for his needs to be met in his situation. Paul wants prayer so that a way can be made for him to teach about Christ in his incarceration. Think about that. Warren Wearsby says this, it was more important for Paul that he be a faithful minister than a free man. End quote. Paul did not communicate bitterness. He didn't communicate depression. He didn't communicate selfishness. He did not even use his incarceration as an excuse to not minister No, Paul was focused on ministry even in his chains. He's not asking for a prison door to be opened, folks. He's asking for a door for the gospel to be opened. So that he could teach about the mystery of Christ. What is the mystery of Christ? Well, you can go back to Colossians 1 and different uh, parts of Paul's letters. He talks about the mystery of Christ, but just to kind of sum it up and not go through it all... The mystery of Christ really is the fullness of the gospel and all its content, right? A lot, Jesus answered a lot of the questions of the Old Testament. Jesus was the fullness of the gospel. Those things that weren't quite as clear in the past became clear in Christ. And part of that, part of this mystery of Christ, 
is that Gentiles are not excluded from Christ. Jesus didn't, salvation isn't just for the Jews. Salvation is for all. The Gentiles can come to Christ. Christ is for all and all can be saved by Christ through repentance of sin and faith in him and his substitutionary work on the cross. And even more, Christ would dwell in believers. That's part of this mystery that, that Christ is, it would dwell in us both in believing Jews and in believing Gentiles. Colossians 1.26 talks about this. So it's because of this mystery of Christ and Paul's devotion to it that he was in prison now. And I'm not going to go through it, but if, if you want to do it on your own, if you go to Acts chapter 21 and you start to read there, you'll start to see why Paul was put in prison and why he ends up in Rome and how, how he gets there and, and how all this preaching of the mystery of Christ and that kind of thing uh, got him where he is. I want you to notice something too. What got Paul in prison was the very thing that he wanted prayer for to continue in. That is stunning to me. He was so committed to his mission. Notice too, he wanted prayer from the Colossians to teach Christ clearly he asks for prayer. He says that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. His, his prayer is not just that he'll have an open door to share the gospel, the mystery of Christ, but he wants to share it clearly. What a heart for ministry Paul had. Not only focused on ministering to Christ, ministering Christ to others instead of his freedom, but he wanted to teach clearly, presumably so they would understand. Now, even if Paul, now some, and I, I read one guy who, who has said that Paul was asking really that he would be released from prison so he could go and share the gospel, and I'm not convinced of that. But even if so, notice, his, his focus is on the gospel going forth and not his freedom. It seems very clear to me and most all the folks that I read these last couple of weeks, that Paul is praying that in his imprisonment, God would open a way for him and others to declare the mystery of Christ, the gospel. Ephesians, another letter he wrote from this imprisonment, Ephesians 6, 18 to 20, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. Listen, to that end, keep alert and with all, perse with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It seems very clear that there in his, in his letter to the Ephesians, he's saying, look, I want you to pray that God gives me words that I can, I can speak boldly. Um, here as I'm in prison. Gabaline points out that Paul's thoughts must have truly been on heavenly things. If you look in Colossians, I'm not going to read it, but Colossians chapter 3, um, Paul talks about, well, I will read the first two verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So Gabalon points out that Paul's thoughts must have truly been on heavenly things to be able to pray this way, far above his earthly situation. He's thinking about heavenly things and praying for things that are heavenly and not just his physical si earthly situation. Is it wrong to pray? For our physical needs and our provision? No. Jesus, in the model prayer, Matthew 6, 11, says to pray for our daily bread. Sure, we can pray for our daily provision. Is it wrong to pray for our protection and our rescue? I don't think so. Paul himself, in 2 Thessalonians 3, 2, asks for prayer to be delivered from wicked men. I don't think Paul's example here is, is, is saying that we can't pray for physical needs, financial needs, those kind of things. But I do want you to see this, that the focus of his prayer request in Colossians is for gospel doors to be opened, not prison doors to be opened. 
And that is crazy instructive to us. Why? Because I believe, just in my personal life and listening to prayers that we pray as a congregation, I think, and individually with each other and all that, I think our prayer lives are heavy, 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 heavy on physical needs, earthly needs, immediate needs, tangible needs. And very, very, very light a lot of times on spiritual needs. We often pray way more for our earthly situations to be fixed, physical needs to be met, than we pray for God to use us for gospel purposes no matter what situation we're in. And in praying that way, we show what we really value. Think about it. We go through a hard time. We got a need that needs meeting, all that kind of thing. We're struggling, whatever, life situation. We seem to get discouraged, bitter. God, why don't you? I can't believe you didn't or you did or whatever. We get entitled. My goodness, we're an entitled people. We talk about the world being entitled, but let's look in the mirror. We are an entitled people sometimes. We are self-absorbed sometimes. When we go through hard times, our minds, when we go through hard times, what, what do we do? Our, 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 our focus shifts inward. They're far, our focus is far from ministry when we go through hard times. It's about us and our needs, the immediate needs. In fact, here's what we'll do. We'll often use our struggles, our situations, our hard times as excuses not to focus on sharing the gospel and ministering to others because I guess I've got this stuff going on in my life. We feel justified even doing that. Our problems and our struggles almost justify our lack of desire and prayer to be used despite that, what we're going through. We think more about what we want God to do for us in our struggle instead of what we want God to do through us in our struggle. For others, for his glory and the spread of his glorious gospel. So let me just bring us to reality. Here's the truth. Don't listen to preachers who tell you different. And this is the word, not my opinion. We know it's God's will for us to share the gospel, don't we? We know it's God's will for us to make disciples. But here's what we don't know. We do not know if it's always his will for us to be healthy and comfortable and financially comfortable and nothing to ever go wrong. We don't know if it's his will for us all the time for that. So, Our prayers for others and our prayer requests to others should reflect the desire for God to open gospel doors and use us despite our situations, maybe even because of them, to declare Christ clearly to others that they may understand and be impacted for the gospel and his glory. Much more of our value needs to be on the gospel going forward, so much more of our prayer and prayer requests need to be seeking that. So, is there any problem? I mean, let's look at Paul. Paul's in prison, two years. I mean, this dude, think about his life. He goes from being an extreme hater of Christians to being radically saved by Christ and then becoming that which he once hated and now the, uh, the preeminent missionary declaring this gospel that he once opposed. This guy was committed, devoted. His life had been changed. He said, look, for me to live is Christ, for me to die is gain. Look, if, if, if I live, my goodness, I get to keep doing this. If I die for doing this, whatever, I, I get to go be with Jesus. I mean, his whole life was radically devoted to this gospel of Christ, sharing it. And now he's in prison. And he asked for prayer that the gospel would go forward. So think about problems you face. Is there any problem, struggle, situation, life circumstance that you face that should rightfully dilute a desire to share the glorious gospel? Just think about this gospel for a second. In Paul's letter to the Colossians 1, 12 through 14, 
giving thanks to the Father, listen church, who has qualified you, you, to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Listen church, he has delivered us from the domain of darkness Let me say that again. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. All right. Let's start over. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints and light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Come on. My goodness, that is good news, isn't it? That is glorious. This is a story of rescue. The gospel is a story of rescue. You were a person in chains that could not could not unchain yourself. You were locked up in your sin. You you could not achieve salvation on your own. God God is a holy, holy, holy God. He is holy. He is perfect. He doesn't just do right. He is right. What he does is right. And, and he defines what righteousness is, yet we have all fallen so short of, of that glory, of, of that holiness, of that perfect standard. We are sinners deep, deep, deep in the deepest recesses of our heart that we, don't, we can't even understand. Our very nature is inward. And yet God looks at us that while we were still sinners, Christ came and died for us. Christ came perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, and bore the wrath for our sin on the cross. And that wrath, that payment, was completely paid for on on Calvary's cross. God raised him from the dead. And through looking to Christ, we can be forgiven of our sin, trusting in him, repenting of our sin. We can be forgiven of our sin. We've, We've been rescued through, because of Christ, I think about, I've shared with you this story maybe a couple times, but um, the founder of the Navigators, a Christian organization, his name was Dawson Trotman. I forget what year this happened, but he was speaking at some camp, and they were out on a lake, um, and he and a a, 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 a lady uh, fell out of the boat into the water. And long story short, he, Dawson Trotman, is is holding this, this girl up, this lady up, so she can breathe, and in the process, he dies. And he literally gave his life so she could live. He literally rescued her from the water, from drowning, but the water overtook him. I mean, that's an incredible story. But the story of your salvation in Christ is infinitely more incredible. Because this is, this is God, the creator, the holy God who became your sin to be punished for your sin so you could be rescued from your sin. This is holiness bearing unholiness so that unholiness can become holiness. This is so good. This is a story of rescue. It's the greatest news in the world. It's reality. One day, all these things that we think are so important in our life, they're just going to fade and they're going to melt and they're going to fizzle and they're going to all go away and we're going to be face to face with the reality of what we did with Jesus and what was really important in life. It's the greatest news in the world. We should should be wanting to proclaim this at every turn and wanting to proclaim it clearly. So here's my question to you and me. Do you desire to reach people for Christ so deeply to share this gospel of rescue so deeply that your desire isn't just to share the gospel, but to share it clearly so others may understand and believe? Do you you feel the compulsion to speak the gospel clearly? You see, church, a clear gospel is what we ought to proclaim, what we ought to proclaim, like Paul is talking. A clear gospel is what we ought to proclaim, not a muddled one. God, don't let me get off on tangents. Not a muddled gospel that's hidden in all the other things we're trying to say. 
A clear gospel is what we ought to proclaim, not primarily your story. We get so emotional and we want to connect with people and make them feel like we feel their struggle. And there's a place for that relational connection and sharing stories. There certainly is a place for that. There certainly is a place for sharing your testimony. But the power, listen church, the power of, of life change and salvation is not in your story. It's in his story. It's in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. So a clear gospel is what we ought to proclaim, not primarily your story. The gospel is primarily about him, not you or me. And I fear sometimes in us sharing, uh, wanting to impact people, we're the center of the story we're trying to share, not him. That shouldn't be. A clear gospel, a clear Jesus is the center of the gospel story is what people need to hear. Our testimony, great, but it should be secondary, gospel primary. A clear gospel is what we ought to proclaim, not an incomplete gospel, you know, light on holiness and wrath and heavy on love and forgiveness or heavy on holiness and wrath. Some people really like that and light on grace and forgiveness, a complete balanced gospel, not an erroneous gospel, not an unbalanced gospel, not a false gospel. They need a clear gospel. We've got to, we ought to faithfully be, be clearly sharing the complete gospel. So the gospel of Jesus Christ is worthy of our daily attention, our deep study, a clear explanation of its wondrous and infinite beauty. You've got to give yourself over to understanding the gospel so you can share it clearly. So may we be constantly awed by the beauty and treasure of the gospel of Christ that we constantly ask God to help us share it in a way that it's worthy to be shared. Clear and understandable. Dealing with these verses that Paul is writing here, it just reminds us that what we pray for reveals what we value. Last year, last, last year, last week, we talked about what we're thankful for reveals what we value. What we pray for reveals what we value. And here's what I fear, church. I fear that we show that we value earthly matters way more than heavenly values when we pray because our prayer lists are full of requests for God to meet temporal needs, earthly needs, earthly wants. But they're very light on God using us to keep faithfully and fervently declaring the gospel in our temporary struggles. What we pray for reveals what we value. We need biblical values when we pray. Let's, let's pray prayers that reflect biblical values. Let's pray prayers that, that reflect how God tells us to pray and for what he tells us to pray. God tells us to pray according to his will, 1 John 5, 14 to 15. And scripture Scripture reveals what his will is. For example, I can't deal with all of it. Just give you a few here. Jesus, in the model prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your king. That, is a, that is a great model of things we should be praying for. And I want you to notice something. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us Today, our daily bread. Deliver us from temptation. These are prayers that we should be praying, not just for ourselves, but for who? Each other. Those are things you should be praying for your fellow believer in Christ. Right here, Paul teaches us that gospel proclamation is a value, a will, God's will. Matthew and uh, uh, Jesus in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, he comes, remember, he, 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 he sees the crowds and he, he heals and teaches and things like that. And he sees that they're harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And, and he, has, he, he, he says, pray that God sends workers into the fields. Why? To bring people to Christ. We should be praying for what the Bible values. Spiritual matters. The Bible values our holiness. God's values are our perseverance in faith, our faithful endurance, our joy, our hope, our comfort, our wisdom, our love for each other, the brothers, and our love for our enemies. 
I think it was um, John Piper, I was listening to his sermon, he talked about when you're reading the Bible and you're studying the Bible, what you learn, pray for that. Pray for that for you and for your friends, your church, your family and beyond. Pray the scriptures, pray the scriptures values. Look at, I won't read it, but in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, look what Paul prays for the Ephesians. Not a single word that I can recall in that passage, that prayer that he prays for the Ephesians is for finances or physical help or anything like that, jobs, anything like that. It's all spiritual matters. The building up of their faith. Epaphras was the guy, I think we talked about it maybe last week, but Epaphras was the guy who brought the gospel to Colossae, to the Colossians. Listen to what Paul says about Epaphras in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you. Listen. Always struggling on your behalf in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. What is Epaphras praying for the church that he was, he's a part of in Colossae? That they may stand mature and fully assured in the will of God. He's praying spiritual prayers. What scripture reveals that, that God values is so much more than just physical healing, physical help, financial matters, but spiritual matters. What we pray for reveals what we value. Look, no tangent here, but I'm going to say this. Don't Americanize your prayers. Spiritualize your prayers. You're not praying American values. We're praying Scripture's values. So do your values line up with Scripture's values? We've got to devote ourselves to the study of God's Word and let our prayers for ourselves, our families, our church, our pastors, our missionaries, and beyond line up with Scripture's values. Let me give you just a couple examples of how to think this way. Most of you know I'm not a fan of the lottery. I just don't like it. Not because of the gambling part of it, although that's part of it, but just because of the poverty it creates in empty dreams and hopes, people wanting to be rich. Some of you, I don't know, I, I don't know that you do, but maybe you're praying to win the lottery or you hope to win the lottery. But, but if you look at Scripture, I'm scared to death to win the lottery. If I were to play, I don't. Because I believe what Scripture says, what Paul says, that the love of money is the root of all evil. And because of the love of money, people have left the faith. And so maybe our prayers should not just be for those things that, that, that buttress and support our physical lives and those things that would add to our wealth or, or whatever that in those quotes may be, earthly. Maybe it should be for, for maybe... A, a, an absence of those things so that we can remain faithful to God. So that we won't have that temptation to draw us away from God. Paul himself, remember, he had a thorn in the flesh, and the Bible says that he prayed, and we don't know what that thorn was. A lot of people think it might have been a physical ailment or something like that, or maybe even a, a real messenger of Satan, as he says, but we don't know what it is. But he prayed three times that it go away. Did, Paul, did God take it away? He didn't take it away. But what did God say? My grace is sufficient for you. He said, I've given, Paul said, it was given to me to keep me humble. And that in his, his being attacked or being influenced by this thorn in the flesh, he was to learn that God's grace was sufficient for him through it, not in the absence of it. A lot of our prayers are like, God, take away the thorn, take away the thorn, take away the thorn. Paul prayed for, to take away the thorn. It's okay to pray to take away the thorn. But it's also, God, pray that if you don't take away the thorn, that your grace would be sufficient for me and that you would do your spiritual purpose in me, and I'll be okay with that. We pray Scripture's values, not just our earthly values. So notice three quick things I'm done here. Paul wasn't too prideful to ask for prayer. Despite his apostleship, his knowledge, and boy, did he know a lot of things, his calling, his abilities, his respect from the churches, 
Paul asked for prayer. He knew he needed prayer specifically for gospel purposes to go forward. And if he needed prayer, surely we need prayer. John Calvin says this, It is not in vain that the Lord has appointed this exercise of love between us, that we pray for each other. Not only, therefore, ought each of us to pray for his brethren, but we ought also, on our part, diligently to seek help from the prayers of others as often as occasion requires. End quote. Prayer, we need to be asking for prayer from others and not be too prideful for that. So are you too proud to ask for prayer? Are you more comfortable asking for prayer for financial and physical needs than you are to ask fellow believers to pray that God opens a door for you to share the gospel clearly? Ask for prayer. Number two, Paul asked for prayer to do what got him in prison to begin with. Here's my quick question to you. Is our desire for the kingdom of God to advance through our lives so great that we would ask for prayer that may cause us hardship? The believers in Acts chapter 4, what they pray, they had just gotten uh, uh, persecuted from the leaders and told not to preach in Jesus' name, but what do they come and they do in Acts chapter 4? They say, God, give us boldness to go declare this gospel, even though we just got in trouble for it. Number three, ministers and missionaries need your constant prayers to speak the word boldly and with clarity. Paul as a leader in the church, he's a missionary, he's, he, he's asking for prayer, and I think this specifically speaks to how ministers and missionaries need your constant prayers. To speak the word boldly and with clarity. If Paul needed God to help him speak the word, bo- word boldly, Ephesians 6, and clearly here in Colossians 4, then I, Cameron, Daniel, and all other pastors certainly do. Look, I got a card a, a, a week or so ago from one of our church members, and it had a a nice gift in it. But the greatest gift in that card were the words that said, you are in our prayers. That's the greatest gift you can give your pastors or missionaries or each other. Everyone, including you, need prayer in this regard. So I know you're praying for your needs, your family's needs, your friends' physical needs. I know you're praying for those things. That's great. Keep it up. That's, that's okay. But are you praying that God opens gospel doors and that you may and they may be used to clearly proclaim his word even if your physical situations don't get fixed? It may seem to you that doors to share the gospel are locked tight. In today's world, people aren't interested Christianity is under attack. It's marginalized. People are too busy. They don't want to hear. We have a hard time even connecting with people, much less develop deep relationships and then eventually get to talking about Jesus. It may seem like doors are locked. People are caught up in the appeal of sinful desires. It's just a crazy, sinful world we live in. They're caught up in worldly wisdom, the pursuit of anything but Jesus. You may really have, like Paul, a deep desire for the gospel to go forth through your life, but you just need an open door. But folks, listen, good news, God opens doors. Listen to just a few verses here. Paul and Barnabas, they're arriving back at Antioch, and they they had been sent from Antioch as missionaries, and they're coming back to Antioch, Acts 14, 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, Listen, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. God opened a door. Here's Paul writing to the Corinthians about staying in Ephesus before coming to visit the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 16, 19. For a wide, wide, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. He's saying I'm sticking around in Ephesus because God has opened a wide door for gospel work. And here he is, incarcerated in Rome. This is Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. He's in prison. Look how God opened this door. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, 
are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Come on. Here he is in prison, and Paul's like, look, I'm sharing with guards. People are hearing that I'm here for, because of Christ. They're hearing the gospel. Even if you go to Philippians chapter 4, some people in Caesar's household had become Christians or were Christians. Somehow they became, came to know Christ. And then Paul's like, look, because of my imprisonment, other people are becoming bold in their faith and going to share the gospel. God, God opened doors. God's a door-opening God. God changes circumstances so the gospel can be heard. He changes people's hearts so it can be received and understood. We are so dependent upon God, God to open gospel doors. He's the, <laughs> he's the ultimate locksmith. So we pray for God to open doors, knowing that he is a door-opening God. So church, what you pray for reveals what you value. So let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for each other. His values revealed in his word. Balance your prayer lives out. His values. And one of those values is boldly and clearly declaring the wonderful, beautiful gospel of our gracious Savior no matter what situation we're in. Amen? God, you are so good to us. Thank you for... <laughs> thank you for a hope and a joy and a peace and a purpose and a mission that is constant no matter what situation we're in. God, I thank you for the example that Paul gives us of how to pray, that our prayers need to be more filled than they are for spiritual things and the things that Scripture values, for gospel proclamation. God, we do pray for the physical needs and hurts and situations of ourselves and our families and those we go through. God, we do. That is certainly warranted, but God, we want to pray as much, if not more, for you to work on us spiritually, which is where life, true life really is, for spiritual matters, for things that you value. So God, help us do that. Help us do that this week. Get us into your word so we'll know what to be praying for, so that what we pray is not just determined by what's in our heads, but what's in your word. God, help us with that. Pray in Jesus' name.